happy new year everybody let's uh, get started on this new year's uh, event and uh, we have a very interesting speaker today and uh, since he is uh, murli's classmate from 40 years ago i think i'll uh, give murli the opportunity to introduce him over to you murli and then sri can take over so i think there's a potted biography of him on the group so i'm going to give him a more personal introduction shri kumar is as uh, shibu said my classmate from 40 years ago 40 plus uh he is an ex army brat he just told us he's been in nine different schools uh was lucky enough to finish with uh, st joseph's at the end <laughs> a little boost for joseph's at the end yeah and then he moved on to iit delhi uh and then i am bangalore and then has been in a variety of places but that's not all important the important thing for me is that uh shri kumar is one of the uh, most interesting people it's always fascinating to chat with him uh, he's also one of the nicest people i mean somehow uh shri don't don't blush but really he's one of the nicest people i know uh and it's just a joy to be with him so i you know when we had this opportunity i thought i should invite shri uh he will take off on any subject connected with the armed forces you ask him anything and he'll give you about 10 different facts all of which are interesting by the way they're not boring facts so uh, i will say no more except it's an absolute pleasure to have known you shri kumar and uh, hand it over to you <clears throat> thank you uh, very much shibu and uh, murli both and uh, for that very generous introduction murli and uh, if uh, if you're going to say uh, you know something about me being a nice person uh, let me just say it takes one to know one <laughs> and i'm sure everyone who knows you who would agree with that <laughs> but uh, anyway thank you for inviting me uh, to uh, uh, to talk to you on this uh, pet topic of mine and um, i'm happy to um, you know sort of play it to any level of detail that uh, we can within the uh, uh, time and the other constraints we've got uh, i do have some slides so i'll uh, i'll put them up but i'm quite happy to switch to uh, to talking anytime to uh, you know abandoning the slides and coming back to talk on the slide but the slides might uh, help a little so with your permission um, i will go to uh, slide sharing which uh, Uh, took a, uh, there was a little hiccup when i tried that with uh, um uh, with shibu but let's try it again so uh, um, it's not yet on your slides Yeah, well um i've put it yeah. up and it's it's on my uh, screen and it's saying you are screen sharing so uh, is it visible now it's still that manager kind of thing all your um your desktop with the no oh, that's the thing is seen yeah that's a, geez, let me uh, come back here maybe you should try that again about switching it off and yeah i uh, I'm about, Closing, to, I'm yeah. about to do exactly that. Yeah. Uh, apologies, everybody, but um, uh, we are used to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's come now. Yeah, great. it's on. All right. So you can maximize it, and then yeah, we are good to do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. All right. So. Um, Uh, i promised to talk about uh, in india and 10 interesting uh, uh, facets of um, india's world war 2 history um, so let's get straight into that just to repeat a little of what um, uh, murli mentioned uh, i am from a family of uh, I, i've never served myself but i'm from a family of military veterans and uh, um, photograph on the left is my father photograph on the right is my father in law both were in the air force um i've done about um, um that 50 is a little uh, out of date now i've probably done about 70 published articles and uh, two books the first of which the cover is um, there in the bottom left it's called ganesha's fly boys it's about a, an indian air force unit whose uh, crest was an elephant hence the ganesha the reference to ganesha and uh, this is my more recent book which came out at the end of 2019 it's about the indian air force in world war 2 and um, it's been quite um, well uh, received from a critic's point of view uh, 
So I'm quite pleased with the way you know knowledgeable people have responded to it, and it's uh, uh, very very happy to hear that Morley's uh, uh, uncle in particular enjoyed it. So uh, now my personal interest in uh, the topic, uh, World War II is one of the great markers of 20th century history. In almost every country, as Murli mentioned, I've wandered around the globe a bit and lived in uh, several countries. And in nearly every country in the world, World War II is one of the markers of their history. Now, India is uh, very much an exception to that rule. Um, it's almost World War India's role is almost forgotten and almost unknown in India. And I've heard uh, I've heard a, a British historian who's very sympathetic to the Indian Army's contribution describe it as a national disgrace. How little is known about India's contribution, both in the UK and in India. So my own first impressions of uh, World War II. Actually, I'm embarrassed to say it, and you know, to professional historians, they sort of get very uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of sniffy about uh, that. But my early impressions of World War II came from British boys' publications, you know, the Biggles series of books and uh, the comic series known as Commando Comics or Air Ace Picture Library and things like that. So my first impressions came from them, even though I personally knew some veterans at that time, because there were no books about Indian participants when I was a schoolboy. Um, I came up with some forgotten photos now and then, but there was very little text. There was no sort of end-to-end -end book about uh, India's contribution to World War II, particularly the Air Force and Navy contribution. So I thought I'd try to write one myself. And I collected uh, photographs and I collected, I used to, you know, go around to World War II veterans' homes and, uh, you know, sit them down, talk to them. I'd collect photos, I'd collect log books which is where uh, particularly Air Force, um, you know, air crew, they write everything they've done in a logbook. And I, you know, made notes and I made recordings. And, you know, this photograph at the bottom right is one of the veterans I've talked to. I'll uh, get, share some details of what he shared with me once. And uh, in the process, I discovered some, what I think are fascinating facts about India's role in the Second World War. Okay? So here's a summary of, some of them. Yeah. A big part of India's role in World War II was to protect China. Now, China was fighting Japan for about four, year, four or five years before 1939. 1939 is normally thought of as the start of World War II when uh, Germany attacked uh, Poland and the British and French declared war on uh, Germany at that time. Um, uh, and, but in fact, uh, China and Japan had been fighting each other since about 1932-33. And in some form or other, they'd been military enemies for 100 years. Okay? Um, and uh, when, um, when World War II spread to Asia, the first two years of World War II, it was confined largely to Europe. It was essentially Britain fighting against uh, um, Britain and France fighting against uh, Germany and um, uh, with some skirmishes against Japan in the Far East, but not very significant. And World War II expanded to Asia in 1941, December 1941, when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. Okay. So at that point in time, China's role as, the, as fighting Japan on Chinese soil became very, very important. And it became very important to the rest of the allies to keep China fighting, because they were, they were terrified that China would come to some kind of accommodation with Japan. And China was tying up about 30% of Japan's army by fighting them. Right? So, they, and if, if China had given up, then th th that 30% of Japan's army would be free to fight the Americans and the British. And, and they were terrified about that. So a big part of India's World War II role was to protect China. And um, the British were in Burma, Japan attacked Burma and India went into Burma to fight um, Japan, all primarily to protect China. So a big part of India's World War II role was to protect China. This is an interest, this is a sort of, you know, it sort of makes you stop and think a little. Now, it's also interesting that uh, the Americans set up an enormous training facility for the Chinese army in India in a, a little place outside, uh, some distance outside Ranchi, a place called Rampur, there was an American military training center for the Chinese. 
and Chinese soldiers were regularly flown, Chinese recruits were regularly flown into Rampur near Ranchi, used to undergo three or six months of military training. And it was the best military training they could get. And on not only the best military training they could get, it was the best food they could get as well. And you know, China's army at that time was a peasant army, and these recruits were skinny and uh, you know undersized, nineteen year olds and twenty year olds. They came to Rampur, lived there for six months, and on average, they put on eight or ten pounds each person, who, each Chinese soldier who came and put on that much weight because they had a very heavy meat intensive diet, uh, you know, designed by American nutritionists and things like that. So as I as as I said, you know, the Japanese first the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor at the end of 1941. In March, April 1942, the same Japanese aircraft carrier fleet which had attacked Pearl Harbor, they attacked India. Yeah. So uh, and, you know, there are films about uh, Pearl Harbor, but there is no, there is almost nothing about the Japanese attack on. Uh, they they basically attacked Trincomalee in Ceylon, Colombo itself, Madras, Vizag, and a few places in between. Right? There is nothing. There is no film like the you know like the films about Pearl Harbor. There's nothing about it. Right? So a little more about that. I'll I'll expand on each of these points if we have the time. So uh, beyond this, uh, you know, another interesting little trivia about the Indian Armed Forces at that time. The Indian Armed Forces, the people who wore Indian uniforms, the, the uniforms of the Indian Army, the Indian Air Force, and the Indian, the Royal Indian Marine, and which became the Royal Indian Navy, the people who wore those uniforms included uh, British, of course, but they also included Australians, Belgians, Burmese, Canadians, Czechs, French, Malays, New Zealanders, Poles, South Africans, and interestingly, I know of at least one officer who flew as a pilot in the Indian Air Force whose origins were at that in the area that was at that time called East Turkmenistan. Now, East Turkmenistan is now China, is part of China. So there is actually, there was someone in the Indian Air Force who flew uh, as a pilot for the Indian Air Force and was actually killed in action in Europe, who was actually of what would today be considered Chinese origin. Then if you fast forward a couple of years to June 1944, which is when D-Day happened in Europe, it's sort of one of the big markers of World War II, Normandy and D-Day and all that. At almost exactly the same time, while D-Day was happening in Europe, India was fighting the Japanese at Imphal and Kohima. And uh, as part of that battle, and then going on into the continuing battle after defeating the Japanese at Imphal and Kohima, the Indian army went on to fight all the way down through Burma, a distance of something like 1100 kilometers from Imphal and Kohima. They fought all the way down to Rangoon and over the next one year. That's a difference of about, that's a distance of about 1100 kilometers. So 1100 kilometers through Burma, the Indian army fought uh, through Burma. And basically, and, you know, an interesting little um, part of that, uh, part of that, of those victories, is that India inflicted Japan's only defeats on continental land. The whole story of the defeat of Japan, how the Americans and the British defeated Japan through the Pacific, through the island hopping campaign with dozens and dozens of aircraft carriers and hundreds and thousands of aircraft. All the actual fighting on land was done on tiny little dusty, you know, coral islands across the Pacific. Right? Where you could, it, you, it would be difficult to put more than two brigades of troops onto most of those islands. The only place where Japan was defeated on continental land by armies running to tens of thousands or a couple of hundred thousand men, the only army that, that inflicted that kind of defeat on Japan was the Indian army. The British and the American armies never defeated J Japan on continental land. They only defeated Japan on, as part of the island campaign and uh, you know, across the coast of uh, uh, the coasts of Southeast Asia, uh, heading towards Australia. Another interesting little trivia about uh, India's experience of World War II is that at the end of World War II, um, uh, the uh, uh, you know a lot of the territories in Asia that Japan had conquered were former British and Dutch colonies. Right? Indonesia was a Dutch colony, and uh, you know before World War II. The Japanese uh, conquered Indonesia, uh, 
uh, when it was uh, at the end of World War II, when uh, the Japanese were made to withdraw from all the territories that they'd conquered, there was initially a, a little hope in some of these European colonial powers that they could go back and occupy the same, reoccupy the same colonies. But the Americans absolutely refused to have anything to do with reestablishing colonial rule in those territories. So the British were on their own. And uh, now the bulk of their army, the bulk of the British army, about 6 million men during World War II, the bulk of those 6 million men had been drafted during the war on a hostilities only basis. So they'd only been recruited for the duration of the war. And as soon as the war ended, they were on a schedule to be released from the British army. So the British suddenly needed you know, hundreds of thousands of men to help them police these um, former British and some Dutch colonies, which had been um, conquered by the Japanese and now the Japanese have been sent back in. So whom did they take to administer those colonies? the only force that had 2 million volunteers, the Indian army. So the Indian army was administering and doing peacekeeping duties in Malaya and Indonesia for about a year and a half after World War II officially ended. And there's an interesting little sideline about one young officer of the Indian army who was in Indonesia and misbehaved and had to be sent back in disgrace. Uh, his name was Ziaul, Ziaul Haq, and he eventually became the chief and the chief martial law administrator of Pakistan, the chief of the Pakistan army, the chief martial law administrator of Pakistan. He was a young lieutenant and a captain uh, in Indonesia, or what was then called the Dutch East Indies, um, uh, and had to be sent back from Indonesia in disgrace because of some misbehavior. I can talk, tell you about that uh, if we have the time. And the final question, which I, I keep asking, uh, you know, at uh, the occasional professional historians forum where I get invited, I keep asking, should the real inheritor of China's victory not be China, but Taiwan? And the reason I'm saying that is that the Chinese government at the time they were fighting Japan was the government of Chiang Kai-shek, which was the political party was called the Kuomintang and it was headed by Chiang Kai-shek. And uh, immediately after World War II, a civil war broke out in China. Well, it had been smoldering even during World War II, a civil war between the Kuomintang faction of uh, Chinese politics and the Chinese Communist Party. Now the Chinese Communist Party took next to no role in World War II itself. They were hiding in caves in the furthest Northwestern part of China which is as far as you can possibly get from the part of China where there was fighting with, the fighting with Japan was all in China's easternmost territories, what they call Manchuria. Okay? The Chinese Communist Party was nowhere near there. They were hiding in caves in the northwesternmost part of China and all the fighting with China was done by the Kuomintang. And at the end of the, the Chinese civil, after World War II ended, the Chinese Communist Party and the Kuomintang fought a civil war and the Kuomintang faction was driven out of China and is now what and and fled to Taiwan. And Taiwan, which calls itself the Republic of China, should actually, in my view, be the actual inheritor of China's role in World War II. China is sitting on the permanent count, the on the uh, as one of the permanent five members of the Security Council of the United Nations, purely because China is classified as one of the victors of World War II. But it was not the Chinese Communist Party. The Chinese Communist Party in the last 10 years has started to make much of the fact that China fought Japan for you know, a total of seven or eight years, longer than most of the allies did. But it wasn't the Chinese Communist Party that did that fighting. It was the Kuomintang who are now confined entirely to Taiwan. So some you know, interesting thoughts about uh, India's Second World War. I'll take a little more about uh, each of these. I'd actually, I've actually got material on each of these, um, which I don't think we'll have the time to, uh, to go through. So as I mentioned, a big part of India's World War II role was to protect China. And China's most effective military training was done in India, sometimes by US instructors. There's a lot of British and Indian instructors as well. And uh, there are some um, videos which uh, show uh, 
uh, General Stilwell, and uh, China, the General Stilwell was the China, was the American general who was um, effectively uh, Chiang Kai-shek's uh, senior military advisor. And uh, so there's some, there's, there, there are some interesting videos on YouTube about General Stilwell and the Chinese troops in India, which if we have, uh, uh, you know, when I do uh, similar presentations that um, uh, we have a little more time, I sometimes play some of those videos, but I don't think we have the time for that now. So uh, just moving on from that to the, you know, the other point I made about uh, India's role in the Second World War, uh, the Japanese, uh, the the, the Pacific part of the Second World War was very much a naval war, more than it was a land forces war. And uh, the Pacific part of, uh, the, of the World War II story began at Pearl Harbor in December 1941. And the, the critical turning point of that Pacific uh, War, of that Pacific campaign, was the Battle of Midway, which took place in June 1942. So this six month period was the period when Japan was most successful in the Pacific theater. And the tide really turned at midway for them in at midway in June, 1942. Now, almost exactly slap bang in between these two, the Japanese first air fleet, the same aircraft carrier fleet, which attacked Pearl Harbor, attacked India. And there was, uh, uh, you know, uh, Winston Churchill has described the moment when the Japanese fleet came into the Indian Ocean and started attacking Ceylon and Eastern India as the most dangerous moment of World War II. And you can sort of, if you, if you look at it at the grand strategic level that Winston Churchill used to look at the war, you can see a, a, a threatening moment for the Allies at that point because the Japanese were attacking Ceylon and they were bombing uh, ports on the east coast of India. And a little to the northwest, the, uh, the Germans in the North African campaign had reached their easternmost point of advance at the same time. So you can imagine that the Germans were within a few miles of, Suez, of the Suez Canal on the, uh, you know, on, the, uh, on the west of India, and the Japanese were bombing ports on the east coast of India. So it's possible to imagine if both of those had broken through, it's possible to imagine a scenario where the end of World War II would have been very, very different. Right? So I think one of the other trivia about, uh, the in, about India and the Second World War, which I mentioned, was the sheer ethnic and national diversity of the Indian armed forces. And uh, this again is something which I think, you know, it's, it's just begun to be um, explored by uh, uh, you know, Western historians, the, the incredible diversity of, uh, um, uh, of the China, Burma, India theater and the Indian armed forces. And as I said, the Indian armed forces included all these nationalities, which I've listed, uh, uh, which I've listed uh, here. And uh, they included um, um, you know, one of the, in the, in the Burma campaign, uh, there were two divisions of African troops called the, uh, they were labeled the 81st West African Division um, and the 82nd West African Division. And that also is a bit of a misnomer because they weren't all from West Africa. There were many troops from Ghana and Nigeria, which are both West Africa. But there were troops from Northern Rhodesia, which is now Zambia. And there were troops from Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe. And there were South Africans, of course. So it was... Uh, it was even more diverse than the, the labels of the forces indicate. And, uh, and this is one photograph, one random photograph, which I picked up, which just seems to show a little bit of the diversity of the, uh, of the soldiers who fought in the East African and then in the China, Burma, India theaters of World War II. So. Then the point I made earlier that uh, India was fighting the Japanese at uh, Imphal and Kohima. That was the closest that Japan got uh, into, that was the furthest that Japan got into India. The battles of Imphal and Kohima were fought on Indian territory and, uh, and they do represent the closest, that the, the furthest west that the Japanese army got to. Now, the, the campaign around Imphal and Kohima took place roughly 
from about February to June 1944. Right? Now, D-Day happened, as uh, some of you will remember, on the 6th of June 1944. Right? So unfortunately, the, uh, the turning point of the Kohima, Imphal and Kohima battles happened around the 22nd of June 1944. And it was completely overshadowed in the British press, in the Allied press at that time by D-Day. So even at the time, it never got as much attention in uh, Western and other, um, uh, in, in British and American and other Western histories as D-Day did. D-Day was in their minds, the big turning point, the return of Western forces to, con to France and continental Europe, all of which is a little overstated because if, if any one army deserves the credit for defeating the Germans on European continental soil, that army is actually the Soviet army. The Soviet army, the German, more than half the German army was always deployed facing the Soviet army. So that's another little sort of historiographic misrepresentation of the popular narrative of the Second World War, if you like. But uh, Besides that, I think while D-Day was happening, India was turning, the, was turning the tide of the Japanese land advance in Asia at Imphal and Kohima. And as I said, from 1944 to 1945, in the campaign that took them from Imphal, which is sort of at the northeastern corner of India, up to Rangoon, fighting southwards through Burma for over a thousand kilometers, in about six or seven months, India inflicted Japan's only defeats on continental land. And that is important because uh, I actually hadn't realized it even, you know, even when I wrote my last book. But uh, some British historians have actually uh, made the point that uh, apart from the A-bomb, one of the things that broke Japan's spirit to, fight, to continue fighting during World War II was the fact that they had been defeated on continental land by Indians. And that was actually an important psychological turning point for the Japanese because they did not consider India uh, an equivalent power. They had defeated the Russians during the Russo-Japanese War in 1905. They had been defeating the, Europe, the Americans and the, the British and other European colonial powers through most of World War II. They didn't really think of Indians as equals. Right? And the fact that they were defeated on continental land by the Indian army was actually a very deep psychological blow and a significant contributor to breaking their spirit. Japan otherwise, Japanese soldier is one of the most dogged of fighting men in defense. And every army that fought against Japan knew it, that it was very difficult to break Japan's spirit. And in the, the, the renewed understanding of World War II that uh, uh, Western historians are coming to now, a lot of them have started admitting that India's defeat of Japan on continental land was a very significant psychological turning point for them. So then <clears throat> these are sort of the, you know, it sort of represents the geographies over which um, India was fighting during uh, its part of World War II. And uh, uh, it's, it's worth sort of uh, taking a little time to see, uh, you know, the extent to which Japan had um, advanced from in the home islands, had taken over this much of territory and were on the edges of India. And just off to the top left of this map, of the second map over here, just off to the top left of that map, in the North African campaign, the Germans were knocking on the doors of the Suez Canal. So this bit of territory that you see in, in this map on the right is pretty much all that was standing between the Germans advancing eastwards and the Japanese advancing westwards. So World War II turned the battlefield into the surface of a sphere. And that actually made a big difference to how important India was to World War II. So now if you'll allow me to uh, sort of indulge me for a few minutes and just talk about the Indian Air Force in the Second World War. At the start of World War II, India just had one squadron and maybe 15 to 20 pilots and we were flying aircraft that looked like this. 
in the top uh, the top photograph of these four. Now, this is a biplane aircraft, as you can see. And technologically, it wasn't very different from the aircraft that flew in the First World War. Now, in the first Burma campaign in 1942, only one Indian Air Force squadron operated, and it flew the kind of aircraft that you see in the second photograph. And it did brilliantly. It was a very, it was a disastrous campaign for the Allies, but the Indian squadron did very, very well and was singled out for having done so. Then from 1942 to 1943, something approaching 100 Indian pilots flew in Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. So the numbers are relatively small, but there was a presence. Then by 1944, in the key battles of Imphal and Kohima, the Indian Air Force made up about 20 to 25% of the pilots and air crew. And they made up 90% of the, they made up 80% of the land forces at Imphal and Kohima. Indians were 80% of the land forces, 10% were Africans, and 10% were Europeans. But the photographs of that campaign, nearly all, I mean, 90% of the photographs show white troops. But as I say, 80% of the soldiers on the ground in, that, in those campaigns were Indians and 10% were Africans. And by that, squad, by that time, India had 10 uh, Air Force squadrons, one of which is flying Spitfires, a very prestigious uh, aircraft. The bottom photograph shows um, a Spitfire, which is operated by the, which was flown by an Indian Air Force pilot whom I've actually met and uh, talked to him. And then in the period 1945 to 1946, the Indian Air Force was in Burma, Malaya, Java, and Japan after the surrender. So the Indian Air Force was in all those countries. The Indian Army was in all those countries and a few more. So the Indian Armed Forces footprint in the period 1945 to 1946 was actually significantly beyond India in, in, um, into, into Southeast Asia. And then by the end of 1946, I think, uh, you know, the idea that partition was, independence and partition were close by, were, uh, were gaining credence and uh, the Indian uh, forces had to be withdrawn from all those countries and brought back to India. So that was a period, as I said, when uh, uh, India had its first encounter with uh, the officer who was to become uh, General Ziaul Haq of Pakistan. So now, just to give you an idea of uh, uh, what it took for me to assemble this, uh, this book, uh, I mentioned that I had, um, uh, you know, that my first ideas of World War II came from all these British boys' stories. Now, serious historians are very big on this concept that they call original sources. So the original sources are actual documents, photographs, uh, you know, uh, recordings of people speaking, films of people on the ground, of, peop of, of people and incidents on the ground. So the operations record book, which is like a war diary, the operations record book of an army or an air force unit is an invaluable part of the original sources. Right? Now getting the operations record books of an Indian military unit for a civilian who's interested in the second world war is practically impossible. But it just so happens that the operations record books of all Indian Air Force squadrons, copies of them are held in the UK's National Archives, where they're open to anyone, as long as you pay about £1.50 per page. So, so a couple of friends and I have spent a few thousand pounds in securing the ORB copies of Indian units that are held by the National Archives in the UK. And this is a sample page. And this is how we've managed to construct the stories of what the Indian Air Force did during World War II. And uh, sort of continuing on that topic, just to give you uh, an, uh, 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 an idea of how the cross-referencing happens. This is an actual sortie report of one particular sortie by a squadron, by number six squadron of the Indian Air Force in February 1944. Okay. You can see the date over there. Now, the interesting thing is this tied up, when I was doing the research for this book, it tied up with a Japanese record, which you can see here. So 
Uh, whoops, sorry, wrong uh, page. This record and this record are referring to the same incident. This was actually the first incident when an Indian Air Force fighter pilot shot down a Japanese fighter during World War II. So this is actually in some ways, uh, well, in the popular imagination, it's a very important uh, incident in the history of the Indian Armed Forces, the Indian Air Force particularly. Uh, people, the, the popular narrative about air combat revolves around fighter to fighter combat. Now in reality, fighter to fighter combat is not actually the most important contribution that air power makes to victory or defeat. There is much bigger impact made by bombers, by transport aircraft, by reconnaissance aircraft. And there's an old joke between fighter pilots and bomber pilots where the fighter pilots say, we make the movies. And the bomber pilots say, you make the movies, we make history. So, so again, to make that point, the, the fighter to fighter combat is not actually strategically the most important contribution of air power. But in the narrative of the stories of, <laughs> of uh, war, the first question that anyone asks you is, how many Japanese aircraft did the Indian Air Force shoot down? But they first ask you, how many German aircraft did the Indian Air Force shoot down? And then the second question is, how many Japanese aircraft did the Indian Air Force shoot down? That wasn't really the most important thing. They, they actually didn't shoot down many because they were specifically told to avoid combat. And there are reasons for that, because what the Indian Air Force was doing was actually much more than just fighter to fighter combat. They were doing reconnaissance. They were bringing back photographs of areas that were completely unmapped. And the soldiers were advancing into areas for which they had no maps. The only thing they had was photographs of that terrain which had been taken the previous day by an Indian Air Force hurricane. Right? So those were actually much more important contributions. And the, the hurricanes that were taking those photographs were under strict instructions to avoid air combat because it was more important for them to get the photographs back than to shoot down a Japanese aircraft. So they were under instructions to avoid air combat. Nevertheless, a few air combats did take place. And this is the story of the, of the first, one of the first air-to-air -air successes that the Indian Air Force had. I think it's quite possible that the pilot who, who did the shooting down actually got a rocket from the British saying, you shouldn't have taken that risk. Your job was to bring back the photographs right, and not to get into combat. Who do you think you are chasing glory? Right. But uh, nevertheless, the records show that he did shoot down a Japanese fighter and the Japanese records admit it. So. So another of these original sources that I wanted to uh, use was, uh, uh, I have a recording. Well, this, the photograph on the extreme left is of a young, of then a young officer called uh, um, Kishinlal Suri, right? Who went on to become, at that time he was a pilot officer, a flying officer. He went on to become an air commodore in the Indian Air Force after the war. And that's him as he was about 10 years ago when I met him. And I actually got a, uh, I, I have I have several hours of uh, recordings of his of him telling the story. He was one of the most articulate of uh, um, of the, uh, uh, the 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 Air Force veterans I I met and talked to, and I I do have some recordings of him speaking. But again, I think it's probably um, uh, you know not really worthwhile to go into it today. But I actually have a recording of well the incident was. Uh, he took off from somewhere in um, uh, Burma and nearly collided with an American super fortress. This is the giant bomber, American bomber aircraft. This is the type that actually dropped the, uh, the atom bomb on Japan. Right? And uh, this young Indian pilot nearly collided with one of those because it was flying with its lights off. So, so uh, and, he's, and I have a hair raising sort of five minute recording of him talking about you know, taking off into the dark and then having to pull his stick to avoid collision with this aircraft. But uh, it's one of those, uh, you know, wonderful things that you get when you actually, uh, when, when you're, you, you know, you, 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 have to, you have to do dozens of, you have to do hundreds of, you know, uh, you have to go through hundreds of pieces of paper and dozens of phone calls and meetings to actually bring together the photograph, the person, the log book, or the operations record book, and a recording. So this is one of those success stories in what I 
in what I did to pull together the information for those histories. So I think the economic, social, and political impact of the war, I think this itself, I think, is a... Are we going uh, to hear the recording? Uh, Do we... If I, sh uh, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll have to exit the, uh, I'll have to exit this uh, screen share and play it on, um, um, on, on, um, on the, on, on, uh, on my computer. Can, shall I try that? I can do it. I'm happy to try that. Yeah, sure. Right. All right. I'm, I'm exiting. Yeah. I'm exiting that. Uh, going to the. Let's see. Yeah. Can you hear it? Not yet. Not yet. Three, if you have embedded it on your slide, which I think you have, only then that mic visual icon will show. Then you can click that. It will play on full scale PowerPoint. Yeah, I tried that um, uh, earlier and it didn't seem to play. But let me try that. But you have to be on full screen. You can't be on edit mode. Yes, I, I'm, I'm aware of that. Let's, let me try it once again. No, nothing. No, I don't think it's working. I'm not sure why. I tried it a couple of times, but uh, you know, before uh, before the before all of you came on, I was playing okay, around okay. with uh, with this, and I had a similar problem once before when I tr when I tried playing a recording. So um, okay. I'm happy. Okay, to... doesn't matter. Yeah. We'll carry oh, on. We'll, yeah. We'll yeah that's just, okay. ca Oops, sorry. Yeah, I'll just uh, carry on from that point. So. I was saying the economic and social and political impact of the war were almost immeasurable. And the, from the economic point of view, I, I think it's not always realized that India ended World War II in credit to the UK. India spent more on World War II than the UK did. Right? So India ended World War II in credit to the UK. And for the first 10 years of ind uh, independence, we actually financed all our imports from the UK using that credit. Now the British cheated us in some, in a sense, during that period, because during that period, they devalued the pound by some 25 or 30%. So effectively they took 25 or 30% off the value of what they owed us. So the, our, their debt to us was denominated in pound sterling. And so they, uh, so they cheated us out of about 25% or 30% of what they owed us at the end of World War II. I think another important, uh, you know, sort of economic contribution or impact of World War II was the impact of was was the construction of infrastructure. At the start of World War II, India had four airfields. Four, literally, we had four airfields. By the end of World War II, we had over two hundred, and all of them were constructed as part of the crash campaign to prepare India as a, as a rear base for the Second World War, 200 airfields, all of which were constructed by Indian labor. And there are horrifying stories, and I've made some mentions of them in my book, about how the land for those airfields was taken over. In many cases, the, 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 the Raj government loved it, the Raj government, because there was, there was money coming from, a, from, from war funds for the construction of those, um, uh, of those airfields. So they used to make the, the provincial governments, you know, uh, the, the Rajira government was divided into the, uh, the three presidencies, Madras, Bombay, and um, Calcutta, and several provinces. And the provincial governor, governments used to bid. They used to bid for these uh, airfields. And the phraseology they used is very, very similar to the way Indian states today bid for foreign investment. They make exactly the same kind of pitches saying we have uh, plenty of land and it's you know uh, you know we can make it available and uh, and 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 the, the 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 social consequences for indians for poor indians were the same because villages were sometimes evicted at short notice so so it was i mean we've got 200 uh, you know all the government's uh, plans for the you know the, the the new regional airfields and all that other than the new Bombay, uh, other than the new Bangalore and Hyderabad airports, the new Kempegowda International Airport in Bangalore and the new Rajiv Gandhi International Airport in Hyderabad, every single airfield in the airport in India is an old World War II airfield, without exception. <laughs> so, uh, 
I mean, they've been expanded. They've been, uh, you know, a little more land has been acquired around them and things like that. But every single airport in India is an old World War II airfield. Uh, Indian princely families made big donations. I mean, the, uh, the airfields at uh, Jamnagar, at uh, Gwalior, at Bhopal, um, uh, several other locations. These, are all air, these were all the private airfields of the Maharajas of those states, of those princely states, donated to the, um, uh, to the Air Force uh, at the start of World War II as part of their contribution. Right? Jodhpur, the Jodhpur airport is also, uh, uh, it was the Maharaj of Jodhpur's private uh, fly, uh, flying club and airfield donated to the Air Force <laughs> at the start of World War II. I, I'm not, I mean, to be, to be clear, I'm not a, you know, I'm not one of, I'm not a royalist. I'm not normally an admirer of princely families and, and Indian princely families and nearly all um, uh, you know, princely dynasties which supported the British throughout um, the Raj era, which is why they survived. And uh, the Indian princely uh, dynasties which opposed the British generally went into oblivion uh, before independence, but anyway. Uh, so there, there was support from, uh, you know, the, the Indian princely families from Bollywood. Uh, there was some support from the cricketing infrastructure, but cricket wasn't as wealthy a sport then as it is now. There is a very significant social impact of uh, World War II, which is brought about by the presence of Americans. And uh, uh, it's brought out in great detail in this wonderful book uh, called The Most Dangerous Place by Srinath Raghavan, who's uh, a historian whom I admire very, very much. Um, he's written one of the best um, books about India's, India's role in World War II, uh, titled just India's War. Uh, but he, it's not an operational history of the war, but it does tell you a lot about these economic, social, and political impacts. And, and there's no question there was a huge, and he's written a, and Srinath Raghavan has written a separate book about the impact of the American presence in India. Another significant, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, social impact was the presence, was the presence of women in the workforce. The, the war effort required people who knew English. And uh, who would be, and who knew accounting, and who knew, um, you know, many of these um, back office um, skills, and a surprising number of Indian, so probably something of the order of thirty thousand to forty thousand Indian women, like in this third photograph at the bottom of the page, something like thirty thousand to forty thousand Indian women served in uniform during World War II, not in combat. Um, there were Indian, uh, uh, there were Indian nurses in the in the in the tens of thousands even then, as there continue to be today. So, so the presence and the, the 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 participation of women in the workforce also had a very significant social impact on India. And finally, I think uh, you know any serious historian will tell you that World War II was a big contributor to independence. I mean, in the early part of World War II, the British signed an agreement with the Americans. It was called the Atlantic Charter, in which they committed themselves, the British committed themselves to democracy and popular and rule by um, the consent of the, of, of the ruled parties, right? uh, which effectively made colonialism impossible. And during the period of World War II and immediately after, uh, the Americans don't get sufficient credit for this, but the Americans really pushed the British and the other European colonial powers to give up their colonies and leave. The Americans don't get enough credit for this, but they do deserve a lot of the credit for, for that. Now, I had a couple of slides. Uh, we're already, I think, 50 minutes into the, uh, uh, into the time that we'd set for ourselves. I had a couple of slides talking about some of the challenges of, uh, um, of uh, recording history, particularly for India. I'll skip through some of those, but I'll just make one point, which is to say that among the challenges of military history, and this is something that uh, other military historians whom I admire greatly have written about is that there's a lot of conflict between history and doctrine. And a big part of that is that the great men who've participated in history and the, the classic examples are Montgomery, Mountbatten and Sir Arthur Harris, who are the three people in these photographs. It, they, they represent great challenges for history. Your slide hasn't history. moved. Your slide hasn't moved. Oh, you, you haven't come to this? Let me, let me come out and come back to it again. Still on that voice recording original sources. Oh, yeah, so, uh, we need to refresh them. Maybe. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to uh, 
<coughs> Excuse me, I'm going to do that again. So. Stop sharing. Yeah. Yes, it's back. Back, right. Yeah, so as I was saying, uh, part of the challenges is, uh, I think, well, uh, you probably missed one slide, but, um, you know, hopefully you didn't uh, lose too much of, the, of what I was saying. So as I was saying, you know, the, the great men like uh, Montgomery, Mountbatten, Sarata Harris, they made huge contributions to the, the progress of World War II. But it's very difficult to write history about them because they are powerful people. They have powerful supporters, uh, or even more powerful than any of these is Churchill. Churchill made a huge contribution to World War II, but it's very difficult to, to write um, a, a critical history of his contribution. And for an Indian historian, the biggest challenge is this man. I get some hate mail occasionally uh, after my book came out, after my second book came out, because, um, uh, because I make the point that the um, Indian National Army was not so much uh, the Indian National Army's contribution to the British leaving India was not so much a military contribution, but a psychological contribution. And I've taken a, I've taken a certain amount of uh, trolling online and uh, received some hate mail from people who told me that I'm being a bootlicker to the British and, and things like that. But um, you know, as this is actually a line that I've picked up straight from uh, the British historian who wrote this book um, up, up at the top left, that group and national misconceptions are formidable opponents to historical understanding. It's very, very difficult to write a, a serious history of uh, India's World War II without being in some ways critical of uh, Subhash Chandra Bose. And uh, so that is, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, in an, in an in a history of the Air Force, that's less important. But anyone doing a history of the Land Forces campaign of Imphal and Kohima is going to be up against that. And a lot of the British, uh, a lot of the Western historians who've written about uh, India, including one or two who are very sympathetic to uh, the Indian National Army, to Subhash Bose. You know, when you actually come down to it, what they write is not always um, appreciated by the um, those who uh, sort of support both and uh, Bose's contribution to World War II above all else. So I think that's uh, that's really about it. And my summary is that uh, you know World War II was much more than Germany, Italy, and Japan versus the US, UK, and Russia. Other countries, including India, participated, suffered, and have a remarkable track record. There are many connections to historic figures and events, including Indian independence, the creation of Israel, decolonization. There's a lot of relevance to current global military involvements, including Afghanistan, Iraq, Kashmir, and Syria. And World War II effectively kicked off global movements in air travel, digital communications, consumerism, urbanization, the dominance of English, the status of the United States. And it threw up questions that are still valid, questions about discrimination, environment, immigration, race, terrorism. Suicide bombing was effectively invented by the Japanese and many others. So, so that's my uh, uh, that's my contribution. I will uh, stop sharing and come back to the screen myself. I, I, I see that uh, we uh, we do have at least one question from Prasad. Okay, so, uh, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Wonderful, Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, uh, wonderful. Really wonderful. Thank you. Excellent. I have a, actually a soft question, not to do with military related, uh, and you touched upon it towards the end of your. Uh, uh, sort of presentation, which is that uh, the timing of the Indian involvement in World War II was a little strange. Here we were trying to throw out the British yes. 1942, we were doing quit India and most kind of things. And it must have been a huge conflict for people at the at, who were doing the fighting to come to terms with fight for the enemy. And we had two factions, the Indian National Congress, which said this is the best time, let's cuddle up and do the Correct. things that the British want us to do versus somebody else whom you probably don't support, but who I may support more having spent 10 years in Calcutta, which is uh, Bose's whole thing saying, let's join the enemy's enemy. And this is the best time to drive them out. So without yep. taking a position on that, 
I'm keen to understand when you speak to a lot of these veterans uh, who participated in the actual battle, their own uh, posture on this conflict. Uh, one, fighting for somebody who you've been trying to throw out, or two, take sides in this uh, Bose versus uh, Indian, quote unquote, yeah. Indian army conflict. So what, how do they feel and what did they sort of tell you? Yeah. So, so I have talked, I have actually put this question to nearly every World War II veteran whom I've been able to talk to face to face. Hmm. And, um, uh, and, and, you know, it's very interesting. Many, many, many of them were actually, uh, well, well uh, just sticking up in and taking two steps back. Um, at the start of World War, in the period 1937, 1938, 1939, the Indian Armed Forces were about 250,000 men. Okay? Yeah. And they were mostly drawn from what the British used to consider the martial races. Okay? So a lot of Punjabis, Sikhs, um, um, uh, you know, Gurkhas, um, you know, uh, uh, those communities. Right? Now, I think those communities, by and large, had a fairly comfortable relationship um, with, uh, um, uh, with the British. Not to overstate it, because Punjab, as you know, was very much a site for uh, anti-British agitation also, uh, Jallianwala Bagh and uh, well, um, and and uh, uh, you know Bhagat Singh and, uh, and and all those are you know rooted in uh, Punjab, but I think that was that was one very clear, clear one one very clear group. Now, in the course of World War II, the Indian Armed Forces expanded by a factor of ten from two hundred fifty thousand to about two point six million. Okay, yes. and in that expansion, particularly in the Air Force and the Navy. There were a great many people brought into the armed forces from non-martial communities, from from communities that are not traditionally considered martial communities. Right. So there there is there is a there is a quite distinct difference in when you talk to the veterans. It's there's quite distinct difference between you know the you know the a Sikh veteran whose family has served in the armed forces for six generations, and uh, uh, you know a, a South Indian Brahmin or a um, or, or a Bengali, um, you know, um, uh, Bhadralok kind of family whose grandfather, you know, signed up. Now, in that second category, and remember, 90% of the Indian armed forces during World War II were made up of that second category. Right? Mm -hmm. In that second category, I've asked a lot of them, as I say, um, you know, what were your sentiments around this? And it's interesting. Many of them were torn, right? And many of them, these were young men, right? These were young men of, you know, in their early 20s and, you know, occasionally women in their uh, early 20s or, or thereabouts, they were generally, the officers particularly were generally among the best educated Indians at that time, because the British at that time, you know, to, to get anyone into the armed force, you had to be able to speak decent English, right? And that automatically made you part of the best educated parts of uh, the Indian community at that time, right? So they were, uh, so they, they were, they were all quite articulate, quite conscious and aware. And many of them, you know, went and sought counsel from you know older family members from pundits uh, one of the most colorful veterans i talked to he went for um, uh, for counsel to the the hindu pandit at his old school his school had a hindu pandit and a, uh, and a christian priest and a malvi i believe and he went to that uh, to his hindu pandit to ask for advice many of them talked to um, political figures up to and including vallabhai patel and uh, uh, the mahatma and without exception, those counselors all advised them to go ahead. And they gave very similar, two or three very similar <coughs> arguments. They all said, first of all, India is going to be independent within about five years. And India is going to need people who've been well-trained in modern uh, uh, industrial and uh, military techniques, right? Second, a lot, of them, a lot of them, including that Hindu Pandit I mentioned, you think of a Pandit as unworldly. That Hindu Pandit was... Um, worldly enough to know what Japan had been doing in Nanjing. Right? Yeah. And, you know, and I, I cannot emphasize enough, Japan's record in those, uh, those years of the Sino-Japanese war was not something to admire. They had committed atrocities on an incredibly massive scale, including the rape of Nanjing. And you know, the word Nanjing alone was sometimes the explanation that some of these veterans gave. When you ask them, I, I mean, I'm sort of, oversimplifying, but you ask them, why did you sign up to fight for the, uh, for the British? Because of Nanjing. And, you know, some of them were offended. You think, I, you think we don't read the newspapers? You think we didn't know what the Japanese were doing in Nanjing? So, so it wasn't an easy decision. There was some ambivalence about most of them, but most of them took some counsel. Uh, 
and even the political council, even from the Congress, even from politicians whose public posture was quit India, Bharat Chod, right? even from them, the, the advice was, it is good to, 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 to acquire all the skills we can. And if we have to fight at this point in time, in 1943, in 1944, we'd better be fighting the Japanese. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's really, yeah. Go ahead, Hema. One thing that always uh, puzzled me about uh, the, um, the, the Japanese uh, diaspora, you know, now when we look at them, uh, mild, gentle people, Shintoism, deeply rooted family connections, you can't reconcile the Japs we see now, uh, tremendously disciplined, huh? to what they were. What was it at that time? Why were they like that? That I mean, who are these people actually? Because mm. Germany, you can tell clearly. If you go to Germany now, they are so regretful about what has happened. Germans yes. now are uh, 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 vitriolic about their. They will. They teach every school student about the Holocaust. Yes. They uh, frown down upon nationalism, extreme levels of nationalism. I've heard a story being said about Angela Merkel. They see you. You're not supposed to wave the German flag around and the, 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 uh, make a big the, deal out of it yeah. because they said we did that once and look at the price uh, uh, so many millions paid. And there was this football match when they were waving the German flag and Angela Merkel stomped across to there, snatched the flag, put it down on the floor and stamped on it. Say we are not going to go in for uber nationalism again. Yeah. So they were like they knew they were like that they you know, were, uh, they kind of got roped in by the whole Nazi ideology without yeah. even knowing what they were signing up for. And, you know, they learned their lesson. But now they are, you know, treat, uh, not doing that anymore. But Japanese is something, we, I don't understand what happened to that culture in those, uh, you know, those years. Yeah. <clears throat> actually, they had, um, they actually uh, went through a, uh, a period of nationalism, uh, a bit like what Germany went through. And uh, they didn't have a, a single charismatic figure like Hitler, but they did have a military government. And if you look at the history of uh, uh, Japan in the, uh, the 1930s, um, well, actually, you can probably start from around the turn of the century, from around 1900, 1901. Right? Uh, they had a fairly nationalist and expansionist policy um, uh, around that period. And in 1905, they defeated the Soviets in the uh, uh, in in the uh, um, uh, the, the uh, in the uh, in, in a war between uh, uh, between Japan and the Soviets in that was centered around uh, the Soviet Far East, right? And uh, they they won a major naval battle against the Soviets, and in many ways that was the first time that an Asian country had defeated a European country, and at that time, 1905. Uh, Russia was, it was before the Russian Revolution, uh, so Russia was still under the Tsars, and it was still very much part of the, Euro uh, ever since Peter the Great, Russia had been sort of part of the European family of, um, uh, you know, of, of, of royal, of, of uh, um, monarchies, which, you know, which had a lot of uh, family and other connections between them. As, as you probably know, Tsar Nicholas is uh, directly related to Queen Victoria. So there were a lot of uh, connection. So, so Russia, uh, Soviet Russia was seen as a European power at that time and the Japanese had defeated them. So they took a lot on board from that. They embarked on a massive rapid industrialization effort in the um, first quarter of the 20th century. Uh, they became quite expansionist at that time. They took over Korea and they uh, exploited Korea brutally for um, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. And the Korean War is actually the result of Japan having to withdraw from um, the Korea that it, uh, that it had invaded and occupied um, and uh, in, in about the 1920s or thereabout. So they had a very expansionist and nationalist policy. And uh, by, by, the, by, the nine, by the late 1930s, they had a military government. They, had, um, they didn't have a, a democratically elected government. They had a military government um, headed by a general and the emperor had been made into a, a, a figurehead. Right? So I think the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the shock to uh, Japan came when, the, when Emperor Hirohito, 
um, made the made uh, the famous speech after the uh, atom bombs had been dropped, admitting that Japan had been defeated. Up to that point, um, no public there had been almost no public acknowledgement of military defeat uh, in Japan. Although you know uh, the Japanese would have known, wounded people would have been coming back, and uh, you know uh, badly injured soldiers would have been discharged and uh, returned to um, civilian life and. Uh, they would have had stories. So some awareness must have been there. But under a military government, it was probably much more difficult to, um, uh, to, to, you know, uh, to, to get that story out. So, so I think Japan definitely went through a period of probably um, uh, 40, 50 years of um, extreme nationalism combined with military rule for part of that period. And it was only after the, uh, you know, they, they, they came up with some half-baked schemes to, uh, to create a political uh, union around the Asian countries they were trying to, they had their eyes on. Um, the, they called it the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. And they, they actually tried to push this idea. But in practice, when they started um, expanding into other countries, uh, their behavior in all those countries was extremely brutal and extremely exploitative. They never set up an industrialized, you know, um, death camps like the Germans did. But the, you know, at the retail level, their behavior to the in the occupied territories was extremely brutal. Interesting uh, phrase, industrialized massacre. Shibu, one, one thing. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go you ahead, were saying... No, no. Please go ahead. Yeah. No, no, Mr. Nair, uh, your presentation was quite remarkable. Thank you. In, uh, many ways, uh, many, many new things one got to know. Uh, you know, you've done, this book is uh, quite exceptional from a point of view of the difficulty of research on a subject of this nature. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying this because I have a little bit of a background on in military uh, in terms of family. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, apart from attempts by you or people like you, is the government of India or the Institute of uh, Defense Studies in New Delhi, are they making any attempts to rewrite this history? Because uh, think, in, yeah, go ahead. In, in, India, in India, there are several other areas where this rewriting of history is beginning to take place. And I'm seeing that happening and probably in another 25, 30, 40, 50 years, we'll have another history of India in a, in a proper way. Yeah. Uh, shouldn't a military history also be rewritten in that manner? I would agree completely. Now, the answers to your questions are that I think the, uh, uh, the Indian government was not particularly interested in, uh, in India's uh, uh, 20th century military history uh, for a very long time. I would say that perhaps from literally in the last five years, a little bit of interest has come up from the Indian government. And um, uh, uh, that is, uh, the reason for that is not so much the change of government in India, but the fact that in Europe, they'd started celebrating the centenary of the, sec of the First World War. So the First World War, as you know, ran from 1914 to 1918. The centenary years were 2014 to 2018. And the European countries, and to some extent America, made a big, uh, you know, almost a festival out of those centenary celebrations. And that every one of those centenary celebrations, uh, suddenly the Indian embassy or the Indian high commission in, in, in the UK, in, in France, in Belgium, in Nairobi, in Johannesburg, in all these places where the centenary of the First World War was being marked, the Indian embassies and the Indian high, high commissions, they were being asked, uh, please send someone, you know, please send some, uh, you know, some of your veterans, please send some of your um, military attaches and all that to attend uh, uh, these functions where we are going to be honoring the Indian soldiers who were at, uh, uh, at, uh, at Arras and Luz and all these uh, famous battles of the First World War. And the initial reaction from those Indian embassies and high commissions, I can promise you was, Completely blank. <laughs> <laughs> but they gradually started to participate. And, uh, and I, know, I know a little bit about this because uh, 
through various you know email and other connections some of those requests actually came to to me and my friends i you know i i'm part of a circle of amateur historians who are particularly interested in indian military history because and you know uh, we we uh, we actually have um uh, you know uh, a certain amount of um networks which which actually work and the you know even the indian armed forces and if they're asked about uh, uh, something that happened in um, france in 1917 or in burma in 1944 uh, sometimes those questions eventually make their way to our amateurs circle so as i say from that from that period from 2014 onwards i think um, uh, 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 an interest began to um, uh, perk up in the in in the british in the in the indian Uh, government on our participation in uh, a lot of these things, which had previously been considered as uh, British history and not really relevant to uh, uh, to us. And I will also add that I think uh, you know I've, I've actually been part of a forum of a um, of an event where a couple of very distinguished uh, British um, historians and one very distinguished Indian historian and I were in you know in this forum and. Um, but i think the point was made that uh, you know india became independent within 2 years of the end of world war 2 right and india was still a poor country a very diverse country with uh, very di- with in different parts of india there had been very diverse experiences of colonialism and there was a need to construct a nationwide unifying narrative so to me it's not surprising that you know the, you construct you try to construct a nationwide unifying narrative of a people that have been united in fighting independence and then somebody points out to you that there were 25 lakh indians in british uniform <laughs> right so and 25 lakh indians at a time when india's population was uh, about uh, uh, 400 million for, uh, 40 crores right so that's a pretty that's that's a pretty significant chunk of the population right? i mean it's the equivalent of about 10 million or about 1 crore or 1.2 crores today so so i think the uh, you know it's understandable that we chose not to emphasize it for the first 40 years or so after independence but i think there are now there's now reasons why the indian government has suddenly realized that's in in our, in our interest to uh, remind the rest of the world that that we had a major role in world war 2 china has been going after this with a vengeance china has uh, has trawled its archives to find photographs of chinese soldiers fighting in world war 2 and they're putting them out the reality is all of those uh, 99% of those chinese soldiers were fighting under the flag of the kuomintang government you know china the, the territory that was controlled by china at the time of world war 2 was only about 50% of china's territory today i mean apart from tibet which we all know was taken over in 1959 um there were there are lots of other swathes of chinese territory of what is considered parts of china today which were not parts of china uh, at the time of world war yeah, well, one small piece of information uh, go on yeah, nair one small piece of information mm-hmm. i thought i'll give you it may or may not be relevant uh, the company that i used to work for tata steel ah. it, it supplied armored cars for the army in world war 2 and those uh, armored cars were called tata nagar yes and uh, i am told uh, at least recorded uh, corporate history tells me that uh, there are one of the most uh, sought after uh, armored cars in the army in the in very the, much in, yeah i have uh, i saw the little uh, clipping that you shared with shibu um, uh, and uh, shibu shared it with me and i was aware of that uh, before and i can add to uh, to that uh, little story i don't know if you know this story but the head of british steel or whatever was the yeah, equivalent of about, british steel at that about, about the rails well he said he said something on the lines of do you mean to tell me that tatas will provide steel to british specifications i will no. eat every piece of steel they provide i will i will tell you the story about it during uh, the first world war between 2014 and 2018 the british steel could not make enough rails so tata steel offered to make the rails for the war effort especially for the african uh, effort correct the east african railway correct. east african railways so yeah. and then the I've british, been, seen them. british uh, the chairman of british rail those days was a gentleman called sir frederick apcot that's right and apcot said that i will promise to eat every pound of rail if the tata steel were able to make steel to british specifications 
history says he had a lot of indigestion after that so i don't know <laughs> i believe that was one of the tata family who said he would have suffered some severe indigestion <laughs> correct if he kept his some promise people who may be interested since uh, sri referred to it uh, what if the war had ended differently in 2015 there was a serial on netflix it's still there it's called the man in high castle yes yes so I, think, I know that uh, because it it assumes that the war ended differently and yeah. it's a nice account half of the united states which has been the occupied west part of united states is ruled by the japanese and the pacific uh, nations yes and the other half of the united states is ruled by the allies so it's yes. a fascinating story of how you know if the war had ended differently what would have happened to the world it, it's Absolutely. it's still available on netflix yes i'm i'm, I'm, I'm aware netflix. of it i haven't watched it but i'm, I'm aware of it mr go mrs nair your presentation was absolutely brilliant thank you sir thank Sweet. you yeah thank you thank you very much unfortunately all good things have to come to an end uh, murli do you have anything any final word to say before we close no i mean uh, sri i mean I, it didn't come as a surprise to me i've not always known you to be this interesting extremely articulate uh, person so thoroughly enjoyed every bit of it Thank you. Uh, and i'm sure everybody did i wish we could have gone on longer and maybe we'll call you back for one more session yeah. always happy i think it needs more time yeah. <laughs> okay good just, night uh, no one second yeah, okay one uh, last okay. when you if she if you ever do come to bangalore please come visit our bus uh, visit our community and i'm sure shibu will have a little bit left over gin that maybe he can share with you <laughs> so please welcome okay. with you when okay. you come to bangalore yeah please do come <laughs> Look forward we'll enjoy to enjoy a whole day of chatting with you. This is a lovely place. You'll enjoy being here. I'm sure I will. I... <laughs> okay. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for calling me. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You'll notice we're trying to make you a permanent resident of our place. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.